Jesus, would you speak through Scott as he preaches your word, filled with your spirit, and give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen. We continue our series called The Son of Man, and the reason that we do this series called The Son of Man is because we were actually just finished uh, our time in the book of Daniel, which is an Old Testament book. And in that book, in chapter 7, Daniel has a vision where he sees God on a great throne and the rise and fall of, of many kingdoms. And then in the midst of the vision, he sees one like the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, and he comes in and to God and before his throne, and he's handed by God an everlasting dominion, a kingdom, and a glory that will have no end. And from that moment on, hundreds of years begin to go on where they ask the question, who is this Son of Man? Until there is one walking the the shores of Galilee, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who begins to use this title, the Son of Man, to describe who he is and what he has come to accomplish. And so Jesus uh, uses this title over and over, and we begin to understand what he's come to do, who he's come to be, and what he's come to offer us. Now, we won't have an 80-part sermon series in the amount of times Jesus uses this title, uh, but we are going to hit a few of them, and because they do help describe to you and to me what uh, Jesus is as a king, what he's come to give, who he is, what he's come to offer us, the kind of king that he is, the kind of son of man that, uh, that he is. And so today in Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 21, we find out why it's so hard to follow a king like this. And so Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Let's pray for a moment. God, we thank you for the gift of your word, Jesus, the word incarnate. We thank you that you came to tell us more specifically what is good, what is true, what is right, and eternal. And as the word of life itself, Lord, we pray that we'd listen to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading begins in the middle of a conversation, you might have noticed. Uh, It's a conversation where Jesus reveals this shocking reversal uh, about the truth about wealth and the access to his kingdom. The conversation goes a bit like this. You have a wealthy Jewish man who approaches Jesus, and he asks this question, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Now, it's uh, immediately a question that comes across as humble and honest, wouldn't you say? Uh, I would imagine Tristan, our, our pastoral intern, would enjoy the teenagers at youth group this week asking a question like this. But it's after the conversation moves along that we notice something's off. See, Jesus uh, and this man get to talking about the law of God, God's laws, his commands. And Jesus outlines for this man God's glorious and holy standard of human life given to us in the scriptures. He just starts enumerating laws. And as he begins to say these things, it would imagine any of us in that conversation would begin to hear those laws and go, yeah, I broke that one, and I broke that one. Like this, he says, have you honored your father and mother? 
that you shall not bear false witness. You shall not say a lie. You shall not covet another person's stuff. You should love your neighbor as yourself. As you hear those commands, I, I would imagine and I would hope that you would know, I think I've broken those. I can think of moments that I did. But what's surprising is this young man shows his true colors, and then as he hears these laws, he says this. All of these I have kept. What do I still lack? Now that's an interesting response. It betrays this young man's belief, his deep belief, that he has all along felt confidence, not humility, before God. He has felt secure, not insecure. And all along, he has actually believed that he has achieved moral superiority. He is at least so nearly there that all he needs is just a second opinion. And so he comes to Jesus. God accepts me, right? I am good, right? And so this startling conversation, we find that Jesus is not his teacher because he's not wanting to be taught. He's not asking Jesus for salvation or help. He's asking Jesus for his sign of approval. And what makes the response that Jesus gives where we started our text this morning in verse 21 so surprising is that it's a laser shot strike to his ego. It's a single thread that Jesus pulls to unravel his whole worldview. He said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. You really want to finish your moral accomplishment project? One last task. Sell your stuff, give away your earthly treasure, and be replaced with heavenly treasure. And then most importantly, come, follow me. What is Jesus saying here? Is he saying that your wealth is evil? Is he saying that if you want eternity, if you want heaven, if you want God it's himself, that you must not have any possessions? If we just had this one verse, without the situation, without its context, we might come to that conclusion. But all scripture, in order to rightly understand it, comes from a situation, comes from a context to help us see what Jesus' command is doing. And, and it's what follows that actually is very helpful for us. It's what happens next, that Jesus clarifies what he's getting at. For while this man walks away from Jesus, no longer desiring to talk to his would-be teacher, because he's already been struck by the single command. He has been made aware that he, is actually, he actually possesses less morality than he does wealth. And all of a sudden, this rich man walks away impoverished of any desire to follow Jesus. Why? Well, it was already the case in his heart. Jesus just helped him deeply become aware of it. He thought he had enough. He thought he was enough. And now he's not. And it's a shocking statement that Jesus makes. And with it, he actually clarifies something for all of us in this room at this moment. A great human problem exists, and we have it too. Why is it so hard to deal with Jesus, this Son of Man? Verse 23, here is Jesus' perspective of our problem. Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. What kind of difficulty? Jesus paints a great picture. Take a camel and get it through a needle, the eye of a needle. What a great picture. That's a tight squeeze. To get a camel, squeeze through the eye of a needle. It's got to be one of those famous mental pictures that ever be painted in our world. But what do you think of the statement? Do you agree with it? I think we might. Many of us probably agree with the sentiment that if you have wealth, if you are rich, if you are considered rich, if you feel rich, then it's going to be hard to want God. I think we can know that that makes some sense because if you have everything provided for you financially, we won't really need or feel the desire to have God provide more. But what we say uh, next about that is often interesting. We could say, 
Yes, I understand that the rich may not want God, but surely others will. When we think of the poor, we think of the destitute, or we think of the upper middle class who are having a bad day. Surely there's other people who are going to want God if the rich don't. That's what comes to our mind, and I think there's spiritual truth there, but that's not what the disciples think. When Jesus says the rich will find it incredibly difficult to enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the disciples are astonished, and they say something we may not. They say, well, who then can, we be, can be saved? Who then can be saved? We can think of all kinds of candidates for the kingdom entry, but if the rich won't go in, the disciples say, if the rich can't find God's approval, then who can? Why would they say that? Because in that time, it was the wealthy that were considered worthy. It was the, those who were rich in possessions that would have been seen as rich in blessing from God. But, uh, but who are we kidding? That's not changed a lot, actually. We feel that somewhat in our own way. When we think of uh, our wealth, when we think about our wardrobe, when we think about our wasteful spending, we often hide all of that under the category of hashtag blessed, doesn't it? And so we see wealthy and we see people who are wealthy and we say, they must be doing something right. We can't seem to help ourselves but believe uh, this alternate gospel that God uh, must be for us if we are healthy and if we are wealthy. And so here Jesus says, not so fast. Not so fast. It's not easier to come into his kingdom when things are going well for us. It's actually much more difficult. It's actually harder for you if you have it all. And so our question is, what kind of kingdom is Jesus building anyway? That's our morning question. What kind of kingdom is the Son of Man offering you? Why is it so difficult to follow him into it by faith? The conversation with this rich young man provides Jesus the best context to deliver the surprising truth to his eager disciples and to us this morning. To say this, that if you have it all here and now, if you experience prosperity and wealth and you can amass great treasure in your life, he says, watch out. And we know by virtue of being in 2022 in Canada that you and I are likely on the list of the most wealthy people comparatively to many billions of others that live on this planet in this moment. And if that's the case, Jesus says that over us hangs a sign that reads danger, not blessing. He says to our surprise that the stereotypical good life the stereotype of good life is not one of ease, but one of profound spiritual difficulty. Why would he say that? Why is physical prosperity, why is the good life a dangerous and difficult life? How can that be spiritually true? Well, I believe there's two reasons that we can see this morning for why it's true. When it comes to following Jesus, why, makes, why physical riches and prosperity means increased spiritual difficulty for you and for me. The first is, is that it makes it hard to see clearly, and then the second will be that it's hard to let go of things truly. First, our sight. The young rich man proves that he is actually blind. We read about a man who literally walks away from the king of the universe, who owns everything. Because in that moment, he thought he was the one alone who had real wealth. If he, uh, in his perceived moral and physical wealth, he could not see in that moment Jesus' ability, morality, and eternal significance. That's spiritual blindness. And the Bible talks about our hearts just like that. It says that because of sin, our eyes of our hearts are darkened, and, and we are born spiritually blind to our actual greatest of needs. 
And so we have all kinds of other things, but we actually are blind in this life to our greatest of needs, God's amazing grace to come pouring into our life for him to actually forgive you and your sin, to cleanse you of all your shame and guilt, to restore you to the relationship for which you were made for, to be a child of the living God. That is your greatest need, and you are deeply impoverished until that comes to your heart. But we're often blind to that reality. And so Jesus talks about this reality of needing to for the blind to see. And we have many stories of that in the Bible, but Jesus actually summarizes it in this way in verse 30 in our text. It's the grand reversal of verse 30, that many who are first will become last, and the last first. To be humbled from the front of the line to the back of the line, that's what we need. And yet how true it is that wealth and success are actual hindrances to that happening. With each dollar that we earn in our abundance, with every fiscal windfall and every passing year of growing financial security, we want to say, I did that. I'm enough. I'm on top. And Jesus knows that our wealth is attached to the idea of earning. And our earning is connected to our feeling of deserving And our deserving is connected to the idea of worthiness. And worthiness is connected to the anti-gospel message of this young man who says, there isn't anything left for me to do. I'm in, aren't I? I'm enough, aren't I? And we begin to demand this life and the life ever after like we're talking to a waiter at a fancy restaurant. In our blindness, Our outward wealth and success, our spiritual entitlement grows out of further health and happiness of this life, and it creates this inward superiority where God must love me more than others because of all that I have. Of course, there's the opposite of that, that when wealth and success and health and happiness begin to falter in our life, we don't. We feel uh, we don't come to God needy. We stay away from God in the resignation that he must not love us. But it's the same problem, just flipped upside down. It's still spiritual blindness viewed through the lens of your temporary prosperity. You see, Jesus' command is, is leading this young man into this grand reversal if he'll let it happen. Jesus is actually profoundly helpful here. He is offering him a way out, a way to see differently, and he is saying, don't stay first anymore, young man. Come be last. And this is Jesus' strange point of this text. The entrance to his kingdom is found through the back door how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God when we are blind to the way in. And this takes us to the second reason, that true wealth is hidden wealth, and it's hidden into the treasure that is Christ. But it's hard to receive, because with increased physical riches, it means we'll only see spiritual difficulty because it makes it hard to let go of that to receive this other kind of wealth that is Christ. See, the rich man was offered in his moment with the Son of Man in his presence a real chance to taste and see eternity itself by following Jesus into heavenly, hope-filled, lasting treasure. And he didn't give it a sniff. He walked away sad sorrowful, as if he was being offered torture. Did Jesus ask him too much to give it all away? I, I think we got to wonder that, if that's true. I mean, the command that we, he gives this man is not a normative command as far as it's not something that you would hear all Christians being told at all times, right, that this is the way of all Christians. You can't have possessions. So the car you guys have outside right now, it, just, it, shan't, it shouldn't be yours. The house you have shouldn't be yours. Like that's, that would be to say that's normative for the Christian life, and that's not what this is saying. We have possessions. Christians have possessions. Peter, who left all for Jesus, he had a boat still. Like, 
Christians have possessions. But Jesus uses a stark word, a stark command to a man who's been using a stark command back to Jesus. I've done all of this. What else is there for me to do? And so Jesus has been very stark with this man. But is he really asking him too much? What if these words are far from too much? They are actually just enough. They are what's needed to be said, the only way to give him the clear wake-up call he needs of offering a rich, and a rich man with real wealth to show him how difficult it is to see what is truly real wealth. Because when he already has a full bank account, when we already have a current love of money and a present sense of security in our possessions, it trumps any future love for Jesus and any ongoing or future security that he could provide. It's hard to let go of one for the other. You see, Jesus is not speaking here uh, as, uh, as a hippie living in the woods saying, man, you just gotta live on less, man, like me. You know, he's not uh, giving the, uh, he's not like an impoverished guru talking to the hedge fund manager who's losing his mind to stress. He's not trying to convince us of a grand socialism project. He is simply saying to a very wealthy man and to his disciples and who are watching wealthy people, to you and I who are watching wealthy people today, that you think that that's connected to righteousness? You think that's connected to real worthiness? To spiritual holiness? It's not. It's actually incredibly dangerous. It's dangerous because your heart is dangerous. You'll let wealth blind you, and it'll keep you blind to an eternal kingdom that's going right past you. And your heart is going to cling on to those things you possess for such a short period of time and the little bit that they offer you, when all along something far better is being offered. So now the question is, what's it like to see? When we are blinded to physical wealth, what's it like to see again? What's it like to let go when we are trapped by our temporary possessions? That brings us to this incredible news that we are given here. We're being told that being healed of this kind of blindness is this letting go of, of financial idolatry that's, that resides in all human hearts. It's not about looking more at your budget. It's about looking more at this one son of man. Peter replies to Jesus this way. He says to Jesus, okay, well, we've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? Now, I, uh, I don't know if he's arrogant in this moment, if he's, it's a prideful comeback. You watch the guy walk away, and you're like, well, we didn't walk away, so are we doing okay? You know, I don't know. But I do know that Jesus responds very graciously. He responds, I would say, in what will this, this will become. Incredibly genuine, deeply holy, and profoundly good. For he points out the fact that these faithful followers, these disciples, will in many ways leave the safety of Israel and be treated as, as traitors. They will lose their security under Rome. Their friends and their family, whom they called dear and were invited to their parties and weddings and the rest, will grow cold and distant as they enter the family that is the church. They will follow a kingdom that will lead to their great cost and their death to follow Jesus. And so Jesus answers Peter's question with this future in mind, I would say. What do they receive for leaving it all? Not just new stuff, not just temporary more blessings, even new leadership, but a whole new world. Verse 28, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. Think of the picture that Jesus is painting for his disciples. And he, here Jesus is standing in this dusty, earthly ministry. They watched him sleep in not even tents, but on the ground as they travel from one village to the next, do a few great things and get kicked out of the next town, and off they go. And they've seen this humility, this life of lowly service that will eventually lead to the greatest humiliation known to man, 
being driven to the cross and hated by the entirety of the world. Humble, sacrificial love, which we celebrated at Easter and we should celebrate at the profound humility of God incarnate coming for us this way. But you find that in the Son of Man statements, the 80 times that Jesus used it, profoundly it focuses in on this. You need to see not just the humility of Jesus, you need to see his exaltation, who he really is, hiding underneath it all. This exalted Savior that is the Son of Man of Daniel chapter 7. You need to see his glorious throne. And the disciples will rule over all Israel as they are meant to. And they will rule over redeemed people as it will fully be. And God will forever keep his promise. I will be their God and they will be my people. And this will be the full work of what Christ will accomplish. And Jesus says, I can see it already. There is my glorious throne. That's where it ends. And so how do our disciples, how do people like you and me deny the attractiveness of the here and now bank accounts? How do we come to growingly disbelieve the temporary promises of our senses of security in this moment? How do we recover from spiritual blindness? How do we escape the difficult trap of wealth, the life of ease and riches, Jesus tells us? By noticing what really lasts by noticing who is better. You see, Jesus doesn't soft sell the prize that is found in following him. He says, go ahead and compare it. Over and over and over again, compare what he gives you to what this world gives you. Just try it and see which one you wanna live for. I have a new world where this old world will fade. I am a better and more glorious king than whoever you think's in charge right now. I provide a more glorious and perfect and loving family than all who might hate you because of following me. Whatever you're holding on to rather than Jesus, there is something far more better and eternal in his hands if you let it go. By taking this title, the Son of Man, Jesus tells us that all else will fade away but him. He is worthy of leaving everything for. If there is anything in your way right now, if your literal wallet in your pocket is closed to godly generosity, and you know it right now, if you are holding tightly to the control that you have over your sexuality, if you're wanting every temptation that you have not to flee from you but to stay around just a little longer, if you want to keep temporary success and are fearful for other people knowing that you are a Christian, what will make you go? What will make you sell it all? What will make you leave it all and follow Jesus? It's hard, and Jesus tells you it's going to be. It's difficult, he says. But here he says something far better than that. It's not just difficult. What is impossible for man, he says, is possible with God. And if you're looking for a summary of the gospel, what the good news is, that's a good one. What is impossible for man has been made possible by God. Because for our sake, Jesus, who is worthy, wealthy, and eternally glorious, as God incarnate, he came for us, and the one who is most first became last, so that you who are last in righteousness and worthiness and in your sin could become first, only by the grace of God, who has done this impossibility for you. The Son of Man has accomplished it. I look at our wealthy city and uh, many, the self-satisfied, the riches of our moment, I feel in that also just the sense of the hyper-morality that we deal with in our time and so deeply feel not a need for Jesus. Uh, The common refrain, that's good for you, but it's just not for me. Uh, We live in a city of camels. And every church gathering and every conversation and every mission group idea that we have as a church and every time we go out to seek to shine the light of Christ with the normal, everyday, good, hopeful conversations we have is like a needle and a hole. And we pray and pray and we ask the questions the disciples ask, wondering how on earth will more and more fit through these needles? How can Jesus ever be enough 
for self-righteous, self-focused, secular friends of mine? How will they ever lay down their moral platitudes and their entitlement at the feet of this Jesus and the new world he provides? How will anyone be saved? With man, this is impossible. But with God, it is possible. It's possible because I've seen Jesus do it for me. I've seen it to you. Every one of us, our story of being self-satisfied in our own riches and wealth until we finally could open our eyes and see Jesus is better than that. His spirit is convincing one by one by one that the small hopes and the little dreams of this life that enthrall us for the moment are not as enough compared to the name that is the Son of Man and the King that is Jesus and the throne that he is sitting on that is more glorious and the treasure that is greater, that far surpasses anything that this life could put into your hands here and now. And for that treasure, it is God himself who gives you himself. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to see. Help us to let it go. Help us to follow you. Help us to live this life in this world for the day when the new world that he reigns upon, that throne, fully arrives. Let's live for that day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for removing the scales from our eyes that we might see your glory, that great throne that you died, rose, and have ascended to sit upon. For you are worthy of it. Your mercy is great. And we ask that you would again free and open hearts in this city, friends, neighbors, colleagues, customers, people around us that we love dearly. Lord, we pray that many more would come to see the eternal treasure that is our God come to save, and that we'd hand our lives gladly, openly, and fully to you, because it's better. We pray this in Jesus, your mighty name. Amen.